day on this Michaels episode. This is Watercolor 102. My name is Jimmy Leslie. I'm the resident artist for Windsor and Newton, and I'm the director of the education program called the Fine Art Collective here in North America. So if you joined us last week, just one week ago on Tuesday, we did Watercolor 101. And if you joined us for that, welcome back. Thank you so much for joining me again today. And if you didn't join us for that, don't worry. We're going to have some How little recaps in here. Can, can and you. I will bring you up to speed as well on anything we covered then. But you can also go on Michael's site and you can see the 101 as well. So uh, no need to worry about that. So let's, let's get right into it. We're going to move down to our surface right here. <laughs> and Stephanie, if you want to bring that up larger here, our, uh, our overhead camera. What we're going to do, thank you so much. Thank you. And what we're going to do here, guys, uh, just a few things. You can find, cer certainly you're here at Michael's right now. On Instagram, you can find Michael's stores. A lot of great information there. You can also find at Windsor Newton on Instagram. is a great place for information. Hey, Jimmy, we're just having a little problem with the audio. <laughs> Could be a line. How's that sound now? You have a little reverberation, but let's try it out. Yeah, lots of echoes still, and no sound. All right then, let's see what else we could do in terms of... Uh... Jimmy, I think you might just have to unmute yourself. I am, I am, I am, I am. Uh, hmm. Uh, we're still can't hear you, Jimmy, but I just want to reach out to everybody. We are working on it um, to try to get the, the audio back. Um, as you said, Jimmy mentioned last week, we had a watercolor 101. Let's, there we go. Oh, you we're just good. came back? We came back. All right. Yes. All right, loud everybody. and clear. Welcome back. Awesome. Technology, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for sticking in there with us. So let's, let's get into it. Yeah, I see some yays coming up there in the chat. Yeah, yay here on this end as well. Uh, so a few things, guys. Uh, last week in 101, in Watercolor 101, which you can view on Michael's site, we covered what I refer to as the three suggested primaries. So I'm just going to mention this briefly as a short recap and then get into this week's topic, Watercolor 102. So in 101, we used the yellow was Windsor Lemon is what we used. Our red in our primaries was permanent rose. That's Windsor & Newton permanent rose in the professional watercolor range. And then we used for blue, we used Windsor blue red shade. Now, I say these are the suggested primaries. And the reason I, I specifically say that word is any red, yellow, and blue is a primary color. But they don't always make the clean secondary colors that we might expect. So as a manufacturer, when we test our materials, we make sure that we offer to you what we call our suggested primaries to give you the best secondary colors. So that's a good thing to really understand your color wheel there just using three colors. But we're going to advance. And again, you can, you can check that out on Michael's site. If you go to classes, you can see our full 101 from last week and learn more about that. However, what we're jumping into this week is what we call a split primary color chart right there. You see those words up in the corner, split primary chart. So what does that mean? We're going to use six colors, and they're going to be two blues, uh, two yellows, two blues, 
and two reds. So when we do that, here's what's gonna happen this week. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to jump to my glasses here. I see some of you have glasses. I'm gonna have to do that here uh, for our uh, tubes. And here you're gonna see Windsor Lemon. Windsor Lemon. Now, Windsor Lemon is gonna give us a cool yellow. So a, a yellow that falls into that temperature range of being a cooler yellow, as opposed to Windsor Yellow. And Windsor Yellow is a yellow that moves more warm. So you see, we've got a cool yellow and we've got a warm yellow. And that's something you wanna think about as you paint. You wanna think about the temperature of the object that you're looking at and what that mood is, whether it's cooler or warmer. And we're gonna do the same thing with blue here. So if you look at this one, bring this up and get it in focus. This is Windsor Blue Green Shade. So it is a blue color that moves a bit more green. So it's a cooler blue. And that's gonna contrast with our second blue right here, which is French Ultramarine. And French Ultramarine is a, uh, is a warmer one. Now, just a little bit, uh, I, I always love this stuff. I love color, I love pigments, and this is just a, a sort of geeky side note for you on ultramarine, uh, an anecdote. Ultramarine, Latin means ultra beyond marine the sea. So original ultramarine was made from lapis lazuli. You know that beautiful semi-precious stone that you, maybe some of you have some in jewelry. It came from Afghanistan. So for people in Europe, that was beyond the sea. So ultramarine. And the first person to ever create a synthetic version of ultramarine was a French chemist. And so that's why we call that French ultramarine. So a little geeky side note, I like that kind of information. Stuff like that always sticks in my head. And then finally, our reds here. So for our, let's get that in focus, our permanent rose, that is going to be our more bluish Oh, uh, somebody says they like the geekiness. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you do. Those things always stick with me when I'm learning. Uh, permanent rose is a more bluish or again, cooler red. And then finally, we're going to take a look at, let's see, get that in focus right there. Scarlet Lake. Scarlet Lake. That's going to be a little more yellow, warmer red. So here's this color chart. Let's, let's kind of walk through this. Now, I'm not going to make the whole color chart. I'm going to mix a few colors for you and explain to you how you can do it on your own. But if I mix the whole chart for you right now, it would take us, you know, it would take me a, a good chunk of our time. And I want to share some other tips and techniques with you. So all I've done here very simply is taken my colors, my red and yellow here, and blue and our next red, yellow, blue right here and put them in order horizontally across the top. Done the same thing over here, right? But done that vertically down here. And so where these all meet together, I've got mixtures. So where I have a Windsor lemon meeting with a Windsor blue green shade, we get this green right here. And having a cool and warm primary set, that's what that, that's what that term means, split primary. Whenever you hear that, you might, you might hear that. And this will apply to you guys. This is a watercolor we're talking about, but this will apply if you're using acrylic or also using oil as well. So let's see how, if we, how we can make some of these colors. Let, let, we'll make one or two here. I'm gonna get out a, a pad here, actually a block, a watercolor block. Uh, if you're not familiar with watercolor blocks, I like them a lot. You'll see, let me flip this around. In a watercolor block, this is Winsor & Newton professional watercolor paper. And a block, you'll see all the sides have this dark area right here, this black area. That's a glue. So what that does is it holds the paper down on all four sides. So when you wet it, it's almost like having a piece of loose paper taped down to a surface so that it doesn't buckle on you. And that little area where you don't have that, see if I can pull that apart with my fingers. I would just slide a little palette knife in there and I could remove the top sheet of paper. But a block's nice, nice stiff surface as well but we're just gonna use that right here. And that's as opposed to having something like a spiral bound pad. And these spiral bound pads also, Windsor Newton Professional Watercolor Paper have this perforation. So you can tear things off nicely there. Um, it's a matter of preference, simple as that. Not, not anything that, you know, it's not like you can't use one or you only have to use uh, one over the other. So let's take a few of these colors. I'm gonna put these all out in my little palette right here. And these are tube colors. The Windsor & Newton Professional Watercolors. So this is my Windsor Lemon. So we'll go with that. And as we do it, I'm gonna put out some of the color for you. And we'll get that down. Now, as I told you, the Windsor Lemon 
is a cooler, make sure I have that in the frame, there we go, is a cooler yellow. Now, if I say that to you right now, if I say that that's a cooler yellow, you might say, I don't know, Jimmy, it's, it's yellow, right? Yellow's, yellow's warm, just like red and orange are warm. But this is why one thing I, wanna, I want you to kind of, a little note to stick in your head, is that color is relative. So I say this is cool, but it might be hard to see that until we contrast it with a warm. So let's put our Windsor yellow down. And I think what I'll do here, just so you can follow along, this is our Windsor lemon. So we'll make a note of that. And then we're gonna have Windsor yellow right here. So let's put that, and I'm gonna go real tight with this. I'm gonna, making sure I'm cleaning off my brush really well. And we'll get a little wash of this. Now, if you have questions along the way, please ask and please know and feel that your question isn't too silly. It's not too elementary. That's what I'm here for. And I love hearing questions from you because it sometimes sparks dialogue. So let me bring this up to the screen. Now, when we look at this right here, here's where we look. And I think we can see a cooler hue to this than our warmer and our deeper, more saturated Windsor yellow. So let's take a look at how that matters and what that does. And whether you take the time, these are little one inch squares in this, right? So it takes a little time to kind of lay this graph out, but you can also just do little experiments on a scrap piece of paper. You don't have to be so rigid about this. I'm simply doing this so that you can all kind of see it clearly. But let's move over here. And what we're gonna do is we'll take a little bit of our Windsor blue green shade. So we're gonna lay that out as well. And let's just make a note of it up top. And then we'll do some mixing with these. So this is our Windsor. I'm just gonna abbreviate blue red shade right there. And then when we do that, that's actually, sorry, that's green shade right there. So when we do that, I'm gonna clean off my brush again. That's always important. And a, you know, a little tip, make sure that you're always cleaning your brush. And if, you're, uh, if your color or your uh, water rather gets too dirty, make sure you dump that out and get clean water. Cause it's something I gotta tell you, I've been painting for decades. So that's our Windsor blue green shade. And let's go with that cool geeky name, French Ultramarine next. So I'm gonna abbreviate that to French Ultra. Uh, but uh, as long as I have been painting, sometimes I'm working with watercolors, I don't clean out my water as much as I should. Uh, and then I wonder, why are my colors looking so muddy? And it's because I'm simply not doing a, 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 just a silly simple thing like cleaning out my water or cleaning off my brush properly. So we're gonna take a little bit of French Ultramarine now. So this is our warmer blue. So here's where we're gonna do a little mix before we get to red because let's bring this up to the camera now. I think this is even easier to see now that this is a cooler blue. So let's mix this Windsor blue green shade with each of these yellows and let's see what it does for us. How does it, how does it differ? So what we'll do, We'll come back with a little bit of Windsor Lemon right here. Now you can mix on the palette or you could also, you could also mix, uh, you know, this is just a little porcelain palette, but you can mix on the palette. I'm gonna mix here right on the paper. And look at that really bright, really intense, beautiful green. Now I wanna to explain to you, why are we getting that beautiful intense green? Because we're using Windsor Lemon it's already a cooler, sort of more greenish, more greenish yellow. And then I'm using Windsor Blue Green Shade. So it's a blue that moves towards green. Well, let's, let's see what happens when we use French Ultramarine. That, that doesn't move so easily towards green because it's got more red in it. So let's see what happens there. And we'll go with a little bit of our Windsor Lemon again. So this is a way, if you don't want to graph everything out, this is a simple way that you could test color as well. We're going to use Windsor Blue Green Shade again. Hey, Jimmy. Yes. We're getting some really good feedback. Lots of people yeah. um, are asking questions, particularly about um, the pigment and the differentiation between the professional ranges and the common ranges, because we, yeah. did, we did refer to both of them, but Jimmy okay. is using the professional watercolor, so perhaps you could touch on the pigment. 
Yeah, certainly, Jamie. That's a great idea. And, and actually, uh, for somebody before, when I was talking about Ultramarine and they liked that it was geeky, well, here's a little pigment right here. I've actually got some in my studio. That's Ultramarine pigment. Look at the beauty of that. So that powdered form there is your pigment. And what happens is when we have a professional grade, so you're, so you're shopping at, at Michael's, you're in the, probably not in the store right now, maybe with, with COVID, maybe you're shopping online. And so you look at the Windsor Newton professional range of colors and you look at the Cotman, which is what we call our student or entry level range of colors. And you're gonna notice a price difference. And you might say to yourself, well, why is one more expensive? Why is the professional one more expensive than the student? And that would be pigment load. So we use the same professional grade pigments. Yeah, and, and somebody comments, this is such a bright blue. It is, it's a stunner. It's a stunner. Back in uh, the Renaissance, the uh, uh, ultramarine blue would have been very prized. You would have seen that in the robes of, uh, you know, paintings of, of the Madonna, and of things like that, and religious paintings. But uh, we use the same pigment in both professional and student grade. It's just that we use a higher pigment load in professional. So you may notice that your color in the student range isn't quite as intense. And that's simply because uh, pigment is the most expensive part of the paint. The other part of your, and this is a little, little geeky again here, but uh, if you like that, kind of a fun thing. This I'm showing you right here, I drop this into my hand. Now, if we were face to face, I'd ask you, maybe you could type in real quick, like what am I showing you right there? Look at that. Kind of looks like a piece of amber. That's often what people say. This is actually gum Arabic. It is the binder that holds the pigment right? We just looked at that pigment. That's what holds. Yeah, there we go. Somebody got it. Gum Arabic. That's what holds and acts as the binder that holds it to a surface. And look how sticky this is. This is a piece of gum Arabic. I'm going to dip my finger in water and I'm just going to press on there for a second, just like that. I can shake my hand. Usually if I'm in a crowd of people and doing this live, I'm, I'm always afraid it's gonna fly off and hit somebody in the eye, but it's really quite sticky. So this is what holds your pigment down on your surface there. Simple as that. And gum Arabic um, is also used, uh, uh, what are the dancers? Point dancers in ballet will grind their toes into a box of gum Arabic, it's sticky. Kind of helps them do that. Also used as a candy coating. Um, but those are your big differences between student versus professional. Also the fact that a, a, a professional range will have more colors in the entire range. So if we go back to our color mixing, notice right here again, Windsor Lemon mixed with Windsor Blue Green Shade. Look at the green that it gets me right there. The French Ultramarine mixed with the same Windsor Lemon gives me a much deeper and not quite as bright of a green. And that's because it's a more reddish blue. So if we go back to our color chart or uh, our color wheel, what do we notice about this? Well, we notice that when we're looking at color, uh, something like red and green are across each other on a color wheel. So when you put red and green next to each other, really bright, bright colors like that, they tend to really vibrate. They tend to sing and they tend to bounce. But when you mix them together, they tend to cancel each other out. So when we're trying to make a green here and using a reddish blue, pull that back down there, using a reddish blue, we get different things going on. Let's go two other mixtures here. And we'll do it this time with our Windsor yellow. So I'm gonna put that right back down. And we're gonna use Windsor blue green shade again. Now this is a warmer yellow. So we should get you know, some sort of slightly different green right here. Hey, Jimmy, couple, just another yeah. question. It's about exactly what you're touching on right now is that sure. warm pool and the warm colors. Interesting question is sure. um, someone new to, to painting, like there isn't any marking particularly on our color chart or mm. in terms of how, how, what kind of tips or what, how could you help them in terms of yeah. determining what would you consider a warm color versus a cool pigment? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so if you do go on the Windsor and Newton website and, uh, and you go to the watercolors and you actually click on an individual color. So if you go to the site and you, you, know, you go to the watercolor section, you click on a particular color and it will give you some facts and information. A lot of times it'll tell you if it's a color that is uh, transparent or opaque. It'll tell you if it's because, you know, we think of watercolor as, as all being opaque because we put 
thin washes down, but some pigments are more opaque. It'll tell you if it's a staining color, so if it's really strong and will easily stain your paper. And we also have, we do have some information about warm and cool, but a lot of it, and, and you know, I always wish I had a magic bullet answer to this question, but it's really doing what we're doing right here. So when we start to look, and remember what we said here, our Windsor lemon is cooler and our Windsor yellow is a warmer yellow. That's something we really see when we start to mix the colors more. And notice with our, with our warmer one here, we tend to get darker tones here. And, and with these blues, especially the French ultramarine, which has more red in it, look at how, how deep that gets and not super, super saturated. I, I would say that our brightest green mixture is Windsor yellow and our Windsor blue green shade. Also our Windsor lemon and our Windsor blue green shade. So it's about playing with these colors and that's the process of doing this. Now, when I was a college art professor, one of the things, well, when I was a student as well, one of the things we would spend a whole entire semester, not just at the hour we have today, right? That's, that's such a you know, small amount of time, but we would spend a whole semester just playing with color just mixing color to understand it better. And my suggestion to you, just like I've, I've sort of done in my, I think I have a page in here in my sketchbook where I was playing with color recently and just kind of uh, experimenting. Yeah, right here. Just laying different colors down in, in my sketchbook right there, just kind of playing and seeing what would happen when I played with different colors. And so I, I will even do that as somebody who's been painting for many, many years, painting for decades. I still play with color to get a better sense of what it does. But I want to show you some other things. I don't want to get too, uh, too caught up. And please keep your questions coming because they're really good ones uh, and, and really smart. Uh, because when you think about temperature, let's, I'm going to share my screen here. And I want to share a photograph with you. All right, so you should see a landscape that's popping up on your, on your screen right there. And when you look at temperature, it's not just looking about temperature, but it's also looking at how dark something is. And, uh, and also it's uh, when, uh, when we talk about uh, color, temperature, and value, those three things. So this is a little image that I painted uh, just recently. Actually, it's a photograph I took this past weekend and uh, I'll, I'll stop sharing the screen in a minute and I'll make this bigger so you can see the sketchbook study in watercolor. But when I look at this, this photo, and I want you to do this, this is a little experiment we're gonna do together. I want you to squint your eyes, squ squint your eyes, just like if, if you wore glasses, it's almost like you took off your glasses and started to squint. Really squint them down all the way. And a few things you'll notice is that the darkest areas, if you squint your eye, are over on the left side in that cliff face. And then notice that the lightest areas are probably right in your foreground, in the rock, right in your foreground, in the lower left-hand corner, and the rocks right in the middle of that river area. So when I'm painting, anything that you paint, ask yourself how dark or light it is compared to everything else. So if that's my darkest dark over in the cliff face, and then my rocks are my lightest light, then I know that everything else should be between those two values, those two, those two darkness, uh, the, the darkest dark and lightest light area. And then that's when I'll also ask myself about temperatures. I think in the sunlight, this isn't an overly bright picture, but I think in the lower, uh, lower portion of these, this photograph uh, where the water is, we get, we get sunlight hitting there. And it gets to be a, a warmer yellowish brown as opposed to the cliff face that not only is darker, but feels cooler relative to what's in the foreground uh, right there. So that's something that when I was actually painting on location, you can see my colors got a bit warmer down here in the foreground and up here. Remember this, this was my darkest area. So I knew that was my darkest area. I knew that some of my rocks like right here were my lightest area. So I tried to fit every other value, right? Relative lightness or darkness in between those two extremes right there. And I also try to think, well, this feels not only dark, but it feels cool back here. So I contrast this with warmth as well. So those are ways that you can help start to set a tone and uh, start to set a mood. But beyond setting a mood, the other thing you want to do is bring some texture to things. So let me show you the dry brush technique. I'm going to do it for you on this little page right here, but I want to show you an example 
I'm gonna find it in my sketchbook right here. Uh, this little image was the uh, Delaware River in a place called Narrowsburg up in the Catskills. So this is just a, this is a little five minute sketch uh, so that I can remember and I can, uh, you know, I, could, I can uh, paint a finished painting later on. But I did a little, I kind of blew up a section for you right here of just one of the boulders. So notice here what I've done. See that texture? That's called a dry brush technique right there. And what I've done is not used as much water in my watercolor mixture as I've done right here. So let's, let's take a look at that. I'm gonna take, a, it doesn't matter what color I use right here. This is just techniques. So any color that you're using. I think since we didn't get out our reds, let's do that. Let's put out our permanent rose. And let me once again, <clears throat> mark that down. And once again, I, I love your, uh, I see comments. I love those coming through. And I thank you for that. Uh, but certainly ask a question, stump me. You can try to do that. I don't have prizes if you stump me though, sorry. Uh, but, but do try to stump me. I like the, I like the challenge of a fun question. Uh, as I said, it kind of keeps a dialogue going, which is nice. So I'm gonna clean off my brush and I'm gonna put down my uh, permanent rose right here. And right next to that, and this is one I think where you can see the temperature um, pretty good. I'm gonna put Scarlet Lake next to that. So when I do that, Permanent Rose is a more bluish, almost moves a little more crimson, right? It's, it's, it's more of a bluish red. And Scarlet Lake is, is a color that has more yellow in there. So I think that's probably one of the easiest ones out of these to see. But the more, you know, it's, you have to kind of train your eyes. So one of the things I said in 101 last week is constantly keep looking and asking uh, yourself a question. Uh, I see a comment coming in or a question. Do you sketch out your landscape before you paint it? I do, I'll sketch it in, in light pencil sometimes. I think you can, you may be able to see that or you may not. Um, let me see here. In something like that one I just showed you, you know what, you can see the faintest, see that? You can see the faintest little lines up there. If you see that pencil a little bit, little bit, right? Uh, something like this one, uh, just a few pages back, this little fire, I, I, kind of a, you know, uh, what do you call that, campfire. I didn't really sketch that out much. I kept that very light and loose. But let's, uh, let's come over here. Great, great question though. Uh, what type of uh, sketchbook is this? This is a, what is this called? This is called a handbook. Something my, uh, you know, uh, somebody gave me one a while ago and uh, I kind of liked it and I've been using it. So this is, uh, let's lay down a wash of permanent rose. So if we lay down a wash of permanent rose, meaning that we've got it fairly wet, and I think you can, right, you can see that. You see how wet that is and how sort of loose that is, and I can really move it around well. So with a dry brush technique, what I would do is I would take my brush, I've got it loaded with color. It's a, it's a dark brush, so you can't see that red on there too easily. But what I would do, I would dab at a paper towel or a rag, and then what I could do, and I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna split these hairs apart a little bit right here and do that. Yeah, look at what happens. When I do that and I have less water on there and I actually split the hairs of the brush apart, I can get sort of a dry brush technique. So if we go back to that question about do I sketch things out, let's just sketch out a little boulder here so I can, you know, a simple shape. And this is something too, you know, when you're drawing, what, what do you need to know about, uh, uh, about objects? Uh, I, I mentioned you want to know its color, you want to ask yourself that, its value, its relative lightness or darkness, and you want to ask yourself its temperature. But when you draw anything that you're applying watercolor to later on, think in simple shapes. You all know way more than you think you know. So for instance, if I said to you, um, I want you to draw your cell phone from imagination, you might say, oh, I, I, can't, I, don't, I can't do that. I, I'm not going to let you look at it. Well, you could. It's, it's a basic rectangular shape like that, right? There's other information that we have on there. It's a basic rectangular shape like that. So our little boulder here is a, is a you know, basic kind of half dome shape and Maybe it's a little more irregular. And I'm gonna just take my, uh, 
take my colors here and I'm gonna mix up a little bit of our French ultramarine and a little bit of our permanent rose. And I'm gonna make a, a, a violet. That's a pretty strong, uh, pretty strong violet right there. Right, pretty beautiful color. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna clean off my brush. I'm gonna come over to my Windsor yellow and I'm just gonna mix a little bit of that with there. And look what happens, that yellow, the complementary color to violet, oh, there it is, grays that out. So I'm gonna imagine that my light source is coming from up here, and I'm just gonna lay down that tone right here. Maybe there's a little area with the boulder right there. So just kinda, just kind of start to give a, a light and shadow form to that boulder. And, you know, I could have other colors of, uh, of the water uh, itself. Maybe there's a sort of a blue green water. And I'm gonna keep this more washy, you know, more washy in there and clean off my brush. And this is all I was doing with that sketchbook image and I'll, I'll kind of bring that back. So I'll keep this sort of watery. But then when my, when my surface dries, I'll come back, I'm gonna mix up, mix up a little bit more of that violet right there. And again, just toning that down with its complementary color, sort of more grayish color. And then what I could do is once, once that area is that, that wet right now, but I do one or two things. I, on a scrap piece of paper off to the side, I, I remove a lot of the water. And then across the rough surface of the paper, you need to get a little bit more on there. And I drag across the surface, there we go. I drag across the surface of the paper and I can get that texture. So that's something that I, I wanna bring out in the paintings to uh, make it more interesting. So if I go back to that fire painting right there, take a look if I get really close right here, I'm gonna show you some little areas. See that right down there? right down there right where I kind of wrote the name of it. You can see the dry brush. You can see all the dry brush in the foreground of the grass right here. And notice I left it much more watery up here in these dark, dark areas of trees and the skies beyond. But then right here, less paint on the brush. And also again, kind of taking my fingers and, and flicking the brush hairs apart and I can make these linear marks right here. The other thing you can do too, is you can take your take your brush and if you do it in a controlled manner let's say let's say i was working on a painting here and i didn't want to get um you know i didn't want to get anything messed up in the rest of the painting you know i could do this i could block off part of it and kind of flick color like that on there so a combination of those dry brush marks with those little marks that's what you see. Once again, if I go back to my sketchbook page here, that's what you start to see here. You start to see little flicked marks. You can see it on my nail right there as well. But you see little, see there's a little dot right there. There's another little dot right there. All those things, combinations, make that boulder feel rougher, makes it feel like it has more texture. But then once again, what, what do we have here? We have dark, light areas on top because the light is coming from above. What else do we have? The color is quite cool compared to warmer areas in the water where some sunlight's hitting that. So that gives us our variety. So always think color, value, temperature, and texture as well are all good things to look at. Let's jump on to another technique though here uh, as well. I want to talk about a few, I'm gonna, what we're going to do, I'll show you, I'm going to grab a palette knife. Okay, I'm in my studio in New Jersey. You see old paintings behind you right there. And there's nobody in the, there's nobody in the, uh, in the kitchen in my, in my house here. That's an old painting. Uh, I'll show you that block. Remember what we said before, I just take a palette knife and I put it right in there. Oops, let me get that that way. And I can just go like that. And that separates the paper from the pad. And then you can kind of peel up and you can just kind of keep going around with your palette knife. And that'll relieve that uh, that glue right there. I wouldn't I wouldn't keep pulling it up like that. I'm just doing that for expediency. Um, I would take the palette knife all the way around. Yep, you can hear that. There we go. And then we reveal that, and we've got our 
We've got our paper. It's not really buckled from being wet because it was held down on all sides with our block right there. So let's look here and uh, we'll take a look at what I like to call granulation because we were just talking about texture. And I'm gonna bring in three examples that I showed last week, but for different reasons. We looked at hot press paper. Hot press paper, if I hold it up to the light, you really can't see any texture in that. It's super smooth, right? When I put my hand across that, super smooth. Uh, I see Mary Strong says, uh, what weight paper do you like? Um, Mary, it all depends. I, I am using 140 pound uh, of paper. I was actually using 140 pound cold press with what I was just doing. Um, and that's sort of a, a, a middle weight there. If you're doing something where you're gonna use a whole lot more water, a 300 pound is gonna be thicker paper. Right, the higher the number, going to be thicker, and a 300 pound is—I don't want to say cardboard like that's—that's that's sort of hyperbole, but it's—it's it's a much stiffer paper. So the heavier weight the paper, the more water it can handle. So part of it depends on how much water you use in your technique. But uh, hot press, very uh, uh, smooth. Cold press, uh, a little bit more texture, and rough, even more texture. Show you those two right there. Let's see if we can get that in there. Ah, there we go. You got to get that in the right light. See that texture right there by my thumb? And then we go with rough and let's see if I can get that little bit more texture still. We even get more texture still. So uh, people who like hot press, anybody can use it. I don't want you to think that somebody can't use it. Um, illustrators tend to like it more because it's so smooth. You don't get a lot of uh, unwanted texture that they might not like. Cold press being in the middle of the road there is sort of generally what most people use and probably quite forgiving for you if you're a beginner. And rough is when you want to bring more texture to things. But here's two colors, uh, not, not colors where I'm showing you on the palette uh, today, but here cobalt green deep and cadmium orange. And the reason I show you these two colors, it goes back to something I said a little while ago. If you go to the Windsor and Newton website and click on a color, uh, and I believe if you're shopping on the Michaels site, if you click on a color, you might see this as well, that uh, cobalt green, it'll, it'll say that it's a granulating color. Now granulating means that certain pigments, certain pigments are larger in size. So they'll sit in the hollows of the paper. They'll sit in there and it's what's called granulation. So it gives more texture. A color like cadmium orange, doesn't really granulate. It doesn't have that effect. So when we look at this, this feels smoother and this feels more rough and grainy. And that's even on hot pressed paper that's not very, uh, you know, uh, not very textured at all. But then if we move from there, let's go to cold press. Now cold press, we get even more of that granulation coming out in a color called cobalt green deep. And in cadmium, we get a little bit more texture because we get the roughness of this right here as well, of the paper, of the cold pressed paper. So I've had people reach out to us at Windsor and Newton. And this is why I bring this topic up. They've bought a color and they reach out to me and they say, Jimmy, something's, something's, I'm glad I got through to you. There's something wrong with my paint. It looks really grainy. I, I don't like it. And then I'll say to them, do you have that tube? And they say, yeah, yeah. And I say, take a look what color is it? And, and let's just say it's cobalt green deep. Um, they have that and I say, that's a granulating color. It's not that something's wrong with the color. It's not that you're doing something wrong either. It's the nature of the color. So when you're purchasing your colors, you can take a look and, uh, and you can know whether a color is granulating or not. And then let's finally look at our, you know, at our rough here we get even more texture in there. So that's that pigment, again, settling in those rougher hollows or let's call them valleys of the paper. And then, you know, here we get a little bit more, let's get the, yeah, we get the, uh, in the light right there. And we get more roughness, even with a color that doesn't granulate because the paper's so rough itself. So something to keep in mind there with our paper. So in looking at that, Let's go and uh, take a look at a few other things uh, that we want to play with here. Because we've got, we're at about 239. We're doing pretty good. Jeannie, any questions coming in? I see some coming up. Just want to make sure we're getting to them all. Yeah. <clears throat> Lots of things coming in about um, asking if you're going to do anything with um, <clears throat> keeping white space, which I think you're going to touch on masking fluid in a little bit. We are. That's coming up. Uh, I'm yes. going to show you two other things. And absolutely, you're, uh, you're thinking along good lines right there. 
What we're going to do right now, though, is we're going to put down some another wet wash right here. I want to show you two things. Uh, and again, this is kind of along our theme of texture. So I'm just getting a wash down. And when you have a wash down like this, you might two things might happen. Uh, you might think to yourself, ah, I, I, I didn't want that much color down. I, I didn't want that there. Um, and what you could do is I've just got a little little sea sponge right there little sea sponge and I can press in there and I can start to lift that color. If I get it a little bit more wet with a clean brush, I can begin to lift more color and start to come back to the paper. It's really hard to come all the way back to the paper with watercolor. Um, it, in, in some ways, it, a watercolor can be a bit unforgiving because when you think about watercolor, watercolor, a watercolor wash becomes part of the paper rather than something like acrylic or oil where we tend to paint thicker and it sits on top of the surface. Uh, watercolor becomes part of the paper. But what can happen there nicely is also we can just gently dab and we can get modulated color there and we can build texture that way as well in the same way that we used our dry brush technique. So another nice way to build texture and I'll show you an example of that dry. So when we do that with our wet sponge and we'll get that in our good raking light again, you can see the textures where I've, I've hit that with the sponge. It might be something where maybe that rock example that I just did uh, maybe you got a little bit of color in an area that you weren't so thrilled about. Um, you like it, but it's too much. You can just take that off of there and you can get a little bit more texture. But then you can get even more texture if you use some salt, just some regular old table salt. So let's do another wash. Let's do it with, uh, let's do it with one of our reds this time. I think we'll use our Scarlet Lake because it's a, it's a nice dark one. So I think it'll show up pretty well. I'm going to just wet my brush and I'm going to put that down. And then I've got uh, some salt here. Now I'm going to stick in my fingers in this salt here in a second. I'm going to make sure I, I don't take that back to the kitchen. My, I don't think my wife would appreciate that too much, especially if I put salt in this dirty bowl I have out here in the studio. But I'm going to take a little bit of that and I'm going to put it right on the surface. And when I do that, I'll bring that up to the, uh, up to the camera a little bit closer for you. Um, see what's happening right there? The salt looks darker because what it's doing is it's sucking up the moisture. It's sucking up the water right there. Same way if it's uh, winter time, right? And you have some ice on your, uh, whatever, your doorstep, your sidewalk. You throw a little bit, you know, you throw the chunkier rock salt down. But the same concept here uh, with table salt, it's gonna suck up the moisture in that area. And when it's dry, we're gonna be able to brush it off the surface there. So, you know, I wouldn't normally want salt to be part of my paint film itself. But when it dries, I can just brush that off gently. I wouldn't use my hand because you can see just from painting right now, my hands are dirty, right, from these colors. Uh, I would use a little clean brush or maybe a clean, uh, clean lint-free rag or something like that. But when you remove that, that's what's going to happen right here. You're going to get those areas of the paper. So these are all, whether you are playing with color, and th this is my term, my kind of theme last week, whether you are mixing with color, whether you're trying a dry brush or a splatter technique, whether you're doing that or whether you're doing anything with lifting with a sponge or uh, salt in this case, have a play period for yourself. What, what, I, what I would not want you to do right now, let's say, let's say the end of this session, you're inspired and you want to go paint. You say, oh, that was great. I want to go paint right now. Don't just paint. I, I would really say, you know what, I'm going to give myself a cup of coffee, tea, whatever, and I'm just going to give myself a half hour to play with techniques. Write down what I did. Write down what ratio of color you used with one another. Because what you're doing then is building yourself sort of a visual library. If you make those notes and you keep those things and you, know, you tack it up on a a studio wall, whatever that means. I say studio, you know, wh whether that's a drawer that you put it in or, or you do have a dedicated space, you know, you just kind of put that aside. Um, but let's look at masking fluids. So somebody brought that up. This is a fun one. So Hi, I'm gonna, Jimmy. Yeah. So, hey. Another question here. Yeah, everybody's eagerly awaiting um, the yeah, uh, masking, masking fluid. fluid. <laughs> it does go by many other names, but we are, this is um, yeah. 
Windsor Newton product, and we refer to it as masking fluid. It's kind of referred to as many other things, which I'm sure you could touch on. But one yeah. thing before you move on is um, the brushes. I did mention that they oh, were yeah. cotton brushes. Sure. Um, you have used a round, a round brush, a one yeah. stroke, and a rigger. If you could just touch on that for someone Absolutely, that's starting out, what are what are some essentials that they could? Yeah, use? for sure, for sure. Now you know there's a bunch of different brushes. When you when you go to look at brushes, there's a bunch of different shapes. We'll take off our little uh, our little plastic protector right there. Uh, a lot of different shapes. And, um, you know, one of the things I would probably do, um, if you have some friends who are also uh, painting, I don't know, a little suggestion is that maybe, uh, I think these are standards, your flat, your round, and your rigor are standards for me. But if you have some friends, maybe one of them buys a fan shape. One of them buys a, uh, you know, what else, a, a, a bright shape or other shapes. And then you can kind of play together if you're, you know, or trade uh, with one another because you may find that a certain brush shape isn't for you. I'm not a big fan of a fan brush shape. It, it, it fans out as the name would suggest. I'm just not a big fan of it. I never have been. You're, you're flat, right? Whatever size you use, size is really dependent. This happens to be a, a three eighths inch or or 10 millimeter. Um, the size of your brush really has a lot to do with um, what, you know, the size that you're painting. Um, I will say this though, I always try to use a bigger brush than you might think. So something like this, this is tiny. I mean, this little drawing I showed you before is probably about three by four inches and I'm using a three eighths inch brush. That, that's kind of a big area right there, right? But I find that a bigger brush means it can help me stay a little bit more loose with my marks and not get into tiny details that I might not necessarily uh, want to get into right away. But when I'm using a flat brush, it'll give me a really clean edge, depending on the paper I use. The rougher the paper, you know, the edge might get a little ragged because the paper is rougher, um, but it's gonna give me a fairly consistent uh, brush stroke. And also with the edge, you can get fine marks like that as well, right? Fine marks like that. If I move over to a round, you know, you might want the round for a little bit more detail work, right? So the round, there we go, comes into, uh, into focus there for us, and that's a number four. And I'll use the same thing. I'll use a little bit of color there and we'll put the round down. And the round is gonna give me a thinner mark right there. I can get into really tiny little marks as well, but I'm just not gonna have that big area of the flat. I can press a little bit and let off of it and get a tapered mark as well. And then the one I, I like this one I showed I don't have it here uh, in front of me to somewhere over on the other side of the studio, but I, I showed an image last week where I had painted a street scene and it had, uh, oh, what do you call them? Like high tension wires, things like that across the street. And what I used is a rigger. So a rigger is a really long head. If anybody's ever seen them, it's sort of like a pinstripers paintbrush and it comes to a really fine point and it allows you to make a really consistent long line. Um, and it's called a rigger. I think I mentioned this last week because it would have been used to paint the rigging, right? Those, those lines, those ropes on ships. So if you look at maritime paintings, you might see that. And um, I can actually show you here. This is kind of nice. I did this on hot press right here. So you can kind of see those marks a little bit better. There's our flat, there's our round and look at our rigger. And then somebody was asking about an angle brush. Depends on what you're doing. Um, you know, there, there are flats that are angled and that might be something if you're doing things that are sort of architectural and you wanna get, you know, you wanna get something where you wanna get into a corner uh, uh, area of something that you're making. So again, sort of depends on the subject matter, um, but I'm gonna take our rigor here and I'll make a mark with that. So look at that long, that long consistent line that I can get really, really gets you that nice long line. But 
let's show you um those are those are again sort of my three favorite brushes but i what i don't want you to tell uh, to tell you is that you know don't use any other brushes jimmy only said flat uh round and rigor now these are just my three go-to's they really work uh, uh pretty well for me um I, I like those shapes they're my favorites um so just something to kind of consider right there masking fluid so hey, Jimmy, masking one, fluid. one more yeah. one more kind of psa up there we've got a lot of mm. uh you know great feedback a lot of very knowledgeable artists they're joining us and helping along in the chat awesome. um as usual michaels has a really comprehensive uh, platform with all of these classes um i know jimmy's making lots of references to the 101 but as anything else, they're all recorded. Um, I would encourage you to all go back. Um, you'll, this video will be available in 24 hours at michaels.com backslash classes. Um, and also the 101s. So before you take any class, I guess, you know, in a series of classes, it's a good idea to take a refresher. But once again, all of these ideas um, are available and um, for you to at the michaels.com backslash classes. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, so here is our masking fluid. It's dry and I put a wash of color over it. So what you're seeing here is where it's resisted that color. So, you know, when you're painting in watercolor, you have to sort of think ahead. Uh, you've got to ask yourself, where do I not want color? And if you, if you do that, you'll, you won't make the mistake of putting a, a wash of color in a place that you want to be very, very light or want to be the white of the paper. But you can ensure that you don't do that if you use a masking fluid. And there are actually uh, three different types. Now, what I used is, um, I used a uh, art masking fluid is what I used and it's got a color to it. You can actually, well, let's see, let's show it to you next to colorless. So the colored one, it has a, a little bit of a yellow tint to it. And that just makes it a little bit easier for you to see where it is on your paper. Because if you're working on a white paper, that, that could be a little bit uh, tough. So it's really just a preference right there, whether you want colorless or art masking fluid. Now, when we put that on there, these are, those are both removable. This is removable as well. There is a permanent masking fluid as well. And you might ask, well, why would I want a permanent one? What, I mean, don't I want to remove it? Well, a permanent one is if you have an area of the paper that you know you never ever want another color on that. With removable, we're going to remove this right now. And if we want to put another wash of color over it and, and have, let's say, a light uh, a light blue where, where the white uh, shows up, we can do that. So it depends, you know, permanent is really when you know, I'm gonna mark a spot as white and I'm never ever gonna touch it again. There's, there's never any way I know that I wanna put color on there. Removable gives you that option. Now, you could use your finger, but look, my fingers are dirty. I, I don't, I don't wanna do that. So I'm gonna just take the end of my paintbrush right here. I'm gonna do that and I'm just gonna, and I'm actually gonna bring you guys trying to just shake here. I'm going to bring you guys a little lower with my tripod right, right here so you can see this. I'm going to get down a little tighter. There we go. And what we'll do, I'm just going to take the edge. And this is like rubber cement. You know, it's sort of like that. I can just peel that right off. And look at how, you know, how rich, I, I mean, rich isn't the word, really how bold, how bold that is. Right? I get the white of the paper. So I can peel that right off. You could take a, a brush and you could splatter it on the surface too if you wanted little bits of, of white texture and, and white dots all together. Once you have, I'm gonna, I'm gonna lift a few more up with my, um, my end of my brush, but once you have some off the surface like this, you're gonna form sort of a little like a, almost like a pickup eraser by doing that. And I could, I could use that to start to yeah, pick up areas. Hey Jimmy, yeah. More questions. I know a lot sure. of interesting um, techniques that are going to be covered um, in watercolor. This one particularly um, where it gives you that contrast with the surface. But people are asking, can about the masking fluid itself in terms of shelf life, can it be watered mm -hmm. down? And I know you're going sure. to touch on a trick about how yes. to um, maintain your brushes while using yes. or your tools. So, yeah. so you know, just Sure. There's lots so, of good things that the, uh, the team or the, the group yeah. is, um, is chatting Great. about. So I wanted to bring that up to your attention. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so uh, masking fluid is a latex base. All right. So that's why it has this sticky rubbery sort of, you know, feel to it. Right. And I've got all that peeled off there. Uh, shelf life. Um, shelf life has a lot to do with you making sure that you put the cap on it. 
uh, pretty quickly. Uh, anything like this, uh, more oxygen, then it's, it's gonna start to dry out. So you don't wanna leave the cap off of it. Um, but it is really hard to give you a absolute number and say, well, three years shelf life and that, that's it, it's done. Um, because if you do leave the cap off, if you don't have the cap on too tight, um, if you get down to just a tiny bit, I would probably decant it into something else. Again, less oxygen, less drying out. But I wanna show you a tip here because it is latex based. And I, what, what I don't want you to do is ruin your brush. Right? So this is really important if using masking fluid uh, because the latex wants to stick to the brush quickly. Even if you try to wash it off quickly, it can get stuck in the fibers of the brush. So you might say, well, what if I use an old brush? You could, but it'll still gunk it up. So here's my trick. I take a little bit, I should say my trick. I, I'm not sure who I learned this from years ago. This is just a little dish soap. Just a little dish, you know, dish detergent. Uh, not detergent, but dish soap that, that you might have in your kitchen or a hand soap. And what I'm gonna do, I'll take our, uh, I'll take our round brush. And what I'm gonna do is just put that in there and I'm just kind of twirling it right there. So it's coating the brush. And I'm gonna do just like if I was, you know, house painting, I'm gonna, take off a little bit of excess. And then I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna take my masking fluid. Now the masking fluid is gonna be removed anyway, right? So I put it on here, you know, whatever I wanna do, whatever I wanted to mask off. And the beauty of doing this is that I can take my water and I can go like this. And the masking fluid comes off beautifully with a brush and it's brand new and it's perfect and we have no problems with that at all. I'm going to just step over to the left here. I'm going to grab a brush real quick. And I'm going to show you this one. This was an old brush anyway, but I used it before just to illustrate. My masking fluid is all gunked up on there on the end and it's hard to peel off of there. I can't really get it off of there and it's kind of mangled that brush a bit. Uh, so it's an old one. I did that just to kind of illustrate it for you guys, but you don't want that happening to your brush. You can see that the shape of the brush is off now. It's gunked up on the end uh, and peeling some of it off, but I can't even really separate the hairs of the brush anymore so that because they're gunked up. So make sure that you do that. Uh, if you don't want to mess up your brush, again, you'll just take your dish uh, soap and you'll put your brush in that a little bit. That'll coat that. Then you can come back into your masking fluid, put it down on the surface and rinse off in water. And it'll act like a shield. And uh, because you have that soap on there, that'll come off. The masking fluid will come right off with that. And we have just a few minutes left. So I want to show you uh, one other thing here. So much we could do in a 101 and 102 for sure, but I want to show you a last thing, and that's iridescent medium. An iridescent medium has got that, look at that shine right there. Now, this is just straight iridescent medium on the paper itself, and here it is mixed with color. So the color I used right here doesn't matter, well, it doesn't matter, but it does. You could use almost any color, um, but I, I specifically chose quinacridone violet because it's a transparent color. And the iridescent nature of iridescent medium will show more with a transparent color. So there's two things, gotta put my glasses back on here. I'm gonna grab one of the colors we, we've been talking about today though. Uh, and I'm gonna grab our permanent, ro permanent rose right there. And I'm just gonna show you the back of the tube. See right there where my dirty paint covered thumb is? You can see a square right there. Uh, it's just an outline of a square. And that lets you know that the color is transparent. Again, you can look on uh, the Windsor & Newton website at a color and it'll tell you if the color is transparent. But look at your tubes. A square like that with just the outline will tell you it's transparent. If it's filled in, if it's black, that'll tell you it's opaque. But when I mix my color, I'm going to take my iridescent medium right here. And let's see, I'll put some, uh, I've got an extra little extra little uh, palette, well, not palette really, it's a, uh, again, what would you call that? It's not enamel, porcelain, porcelain. And look at that, Oof. that's got some shine to it. You're looking for shine, iridescent medium will do it. So iridescent medium, I can take uh, my cleaned off brush here now, and if I wanna just put that down right here, 
on the paper. So you could put this over a dry color already. I can actually, so let's do that actually. If I really scrub with it, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm probably gonna pick up some of that color because remember watercolor remains soluble, right? Meaning that you can always lift it with color to a certain degree, but we get that shininess. We can see more of that shininess right there, that iridescent quality that we see. And then what we can do is we can mix uh, color together. So uh, with our, I'm gonna clean off my brush there and we'll take, take one more clean porcelain tray right there. And I'm going to take a wash of my permanent rose because that's a transparent color. And I'm going to clean off my brush. Remember, I keep saying that over and over. I want to, I want to drive that point home, just kind of good studio habits of, of continually cleaning off your brush. Because what I don't want to do is dip my brush in here. You know, I, and I'm, I put a lot of this out for effect here, guys. You know, put, it, put out just what you need. Um, but I don't want to get color in here. So if, I, if my brush is clean, I'm not doing that. And then I can mix. And let's see, let's bring that up there and see if we can wiggle that around. Yeah, you can get some sparkly. See that? right over there. Depends on where I put it in the light. Oh yeah, there we go. Sparkly, sparkly. Um, somebody says, is por are porcelain trays better than plastic palettes? I, I tend to like that. I'll put some down on the paper here now. I tend to like uh, porcelain a little better. I just kind of like the way uh, the paint glides across the surface and a little easier to clean up than um, than plastic, but you're all right. You're all right with plastic. Don't, don't, don't let that hold you back. Um, the only thing I would say that you, you wouldn't be good with is um, like a disposable palette that's like a uh, wax paper palette. Um, Stephanie, if you could bring it back um, towards my way here, because I know we're out of time. Uh, just a few, a few things to share. Uh, I, first of all, thank you so much uh, for joining me today. It's, I love sharing a lot of these techniques, you know, they're, they're basic techniques. You know, this is watercolor 102 as opposed to the 101, but that doesn't mean they're not lifelong techniques. They're really important ones as well. And especially when we're talking about color, I cannot stress enough the idea to play, play, play with color, play with these techniques and build what I call that visual library for yourself. Because if you just start painting, and you don't really have the dialogue and ask yourself questions about color, whether it's warm or cool, whether it's dark or light, uh, what the shapes of the objects are that you're painting, you kind of go into it blindly. Uh, and, and, then you, and then you wonder why the painting is not working out. So having an inner dialogue with yourself is a great way to just train yourself mentally and visually. Uh, I'll leave you one last thing that I mentioned last week is go out and have a little walk around your neighborhood this afternoon, this evening, and just take things in. Take the visuals in and ask yourself questions as if you were going to paint. Don't paint, just go for a walk, but ask yourself questions about the process and, and get your mindset uh, in there. And uh, otherwise, this was a joy and I really, I really appreciate your time. Uh, Jeannie, anything uh, following up on your end? All good. I tell everyone the class will be recorded. You can find it at michaels.com yes. backslash classes. Jimmy can be followed um, on his Instagram, which you can put that back. Um, it's Jimmy Leslie Art. Um, and also the TFA, T F A C N A, which is the TFA from North America, um, had a lot of interesting uh, feedback. Thank you all for participating, really, from some favorable responses. And let us know what more you want from us when you do the survey. Um, and we will all be seeing you soon and uh, enjoy the day. Thanks, everybody.